everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our Y&R chat for Sunday, November 26th, 2017. We only had three episodes to chew on this week, but it was still a very exciting week in Genoa City. Apparently, it was haircut week. <laughs> I think Y&R must have brought in a stylist to like clip, chop, and color everyone. <laughs> um, Ashley and Phyllis both had very drastic uh, hair cuts this week. Um, they, they are now sporting, both of them, kind of a sassy, shorter, layered bob look. I thought they both looked very nice. Who did, whose is better? Who got the better haircut, Ashley or Phyllis? I think for my money, I'm going to have to go with Ashley, merely because I think there's more layers. It's got a little bit more length on it. The color looks good. It looks clean. It looks sophisticated. Phyllis's hair is, is fine. It's more of a severe cut, like you've got the, the very straight line. Uh, and I, I almost kind of wish that Phyllis would have just a touch darker color. I wouldn't mind seeing maybe a an autumn, a little touch of autumn brown, or maybe even a hint of red, just a hint, something. Or if she likes the blonde, maybe maybe a strawberry. I, I, I keep wanting a little red, I think, in Phyllis's hair. I can't help myself. Um, but I swear, I think that Jason Thompson got his hair dyed because Billy was starting to rock a little bit of a uh, salt and pepper gray at the temples and when he came into Thanksgiving bringing his pie to Jack uh, I, I noticed that his hair seemed like a stark brown now which is a little bit of a shame because I like the sexy salt and pepper look but uh, yeah I mean like literally they must have brought somebody in and just did everybody's hair we're gonna have to see who else will show up next week maybe with a, a new do <laughs> So last week, we happened to touch on a little bit uh, about the differences between the Newman family and the Abbott family. And I thought that this week's show really highlighted some of those differences really well. The Abbott's have this fantastic way of pulling together while the Newman family is always in a state of somehow pulling each other's hair out. Like we ended the week on Wednesday's show with the Abbots coming together, you know, having this feeling of solidarity. And we ended Wednesday's show with the Newmans, with Victor sitting alone. So I thought that was a very stark contrast and a really good way to show what the difference between these two families are. And, and even just the tone of their two Thanksgiving gatherings, the Abbots were very positive. They were, they just were coming together and the Newmans were just sort of struggling to keep it together. Um, I, at this point, have such a hard time feeling sympathy for Victor, knowing that his family is in this state of disarray. I think that Victor is to blame for the fact that his family isn't close. Jack does a really good job at this point of bonding the siblings, bringing everyone together, whereas Victor has this tendency to pit them all against one another. If Victor really wanted peace in his family, he would start by embracing the mother of his children, Nikki. He knows that he wants to be with Nikki. He just doesn't want to admit it or even take that out of it. Even if you can't forge a, a repaired romance with Nikki, you certainly can start to treat her better. You can give her some respect. You can at least acknowledge the time that you've spent together. Acknowledge her as the smart and sophisticated woman that she is that deserves your respect. That would do a lot just to create some kind of a base for the Newman family and then pull the children in from there. And instead, he just creates an atmosphere of everyone feeling like they have to fight for anything that they get. I'm surprised they weren't like arguing over who gets the wishbone at the, at the Newman uh, family Thanksgiving. I mean, you've got Victoria and Abby on, just on the cusp of a, 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 a 
spewed. It's getting ready to, to, to burst. And Victor is in a position where he could squash that feud. I mean, instead of like pitting his children against each other for the top dog position at Newman Enterprises or in his life, uh, he could just encourage them to work together and have a healthy family business in the way that the, uh, that the Abbots have and the way Jack has and John did. But Victor has isolated Nikki. He's isolated Nick. Nick doesn't want to be anywhere around him. In fact, Victor has pulled together this group of stragglers from the family. I mean, the, I mean, Victoria's there with her kids, but Nick doesn't even go. Nick and Nikki aren't even planning to go to the event. Nick would rather lay on the couch and watch football <laughs> than go deal with Victor's whole shebang. And I really can't blame him. It was weird that Chelsea went to Victor's Thanksgiving. I think Chelsea's just trying so hard to make sure that Victor and Connor still have a connection together, but it was it was really surprising that she decided to go and Nick was just hanging out at home. Nikki stopped by assuming that, you know, Chelsea was going to be there with him and that, there, you know, but it, it just wasn't the case. Nikki had to end up convincing Nick to go out to the ranch, mostly because of Chelsea and Faith being there. I mean, the, the, the pieces of the family are there, but the, you know, the core foundation is just so broken. It's because Victor is broken. The Newman family is broken because Victor is broken. When Nikki and Nick show up at the door, did he welcome Welcome them with open arms? No. I mean, he could. He he wanted to kick them right back out. I mean, he pretty much said, "You're not welcome here," which is so unnecessary. It's so against the tone of what Thanksgiving even is. I mean, he just finishes giving this great speech about how grateful he is for everything that he has, and then he turns around immediately and is ready to turn his wife and his son away. I mean, it's just. It's, this is Victor's fault. Um, only because of faith did Victor allow those two in. Um, and I was happy to see that Nick and Chelsea did have a chance to address the um, the drama that happened to them last week. It was Nikki who encouraged Nick to talk to Chelsea and see if there was a way to work it out. Does anybody else feel a little surprised by how supportive Nikki was of Chelsea and Nick's relationship. I just, I would have expected Nikki to be judgmental toward Chelsea, just uh, like, g given the fact that her dirty, her, her dirty past has just been broadcast on TV for all the world to see, it does bring a certain, um, sullying to the Newman family name. Not that they haven't certainly sullied that name plenty, but I could, I just could almost see the Newmans choosing to ostracize Chelsea instead of embracing her. I mean, I'm glad that they embrace her. It just, the, just to me, it's a little, um, uh, it seems a little off brand for Nikki. She, I mean, would any other of Nick's girlfriends or wives, would she have done that? What if it was Sharon? <laughs> if it was Sharon that would have had uh, her scandal broadcast on TV, I don't know if Nikki would have been quite so forgiving, but Nikki and Chelsea do have a chance to talk. Um, she apologizes for um, not being more sensitive to the fact that he was going through this issue with his club burning down and now the drama of the arson investigation, which I'm not sure if we're going to continue to hear more about. I don't know if that's going to become a thing, the whole arson investigation. Uh, I, I think so. I have a feeling they're going to Put the, the police are going to be putting pressure on Nick, uh, um, probably starting next week. But Nick does also apologize to Chelsea for, um, you know, he for saying basically that he overreacted about Hillary's story. He knew all of that about her, and he knew that she, you know, that that was damaging to her, to her reputation, to her life, and he wasn't supportive of her. So they were able to come together. And 
and make a, amends and they you know kind of kissed and made up and it was a happy thanksgiving for for nikki and chelsea they they left the stuffy newman thanksgiving party and they ended up going over to the athletic club afterward where they run into probably one of the funnest part of the week the thanksgiving stragglers <laughs> i mean you've got the newmans and the abbots but then you've also got the misfits you know all of the various puzzle pieces that didn't fit at either gathering they're all sitting at the athletic club commiserating you've got Phyllis, they're annoyed about everything that's going on with Billy and, and deep down in her heart, sad that she's not with him today. You've got Ravi, we'll talk about all that stuff in a little bit. You've got Hillary, she doesn't really have a place, plus she's just making herself uh, available for work on even though it is a holiday. And um, Chelsea and Nick come into that. There's, of course, a little bit of rift between Chelsea and Hillary, but they all kind of sit there and commiserate. And it was Billy who walked in. Uh, to, he's kind of the king of the misfits, right? He comes in, sees them all sitting there, seeming like just hang dog on what should be a joyous occasion, and he decides to elevate it. I loved it. He just comes. Uh, he just comes out of nowhere and says, "You know what? I'm not." gonna let you guys be sad on this holiday let's do something the abbots have a private jet i am gonna suggest that we all just get on it right now go down to new orleans have some drinks have some food have some partying and just enjoy ourselves i thought that was fabulous i loved getting that sense of oh yeah these people are crazy rich <laughs> they have these wild lives where there are no limitations you can do what you want i mean money is no obstacle and just the idea that they could jet off on thanksgiving evening to go have a party is so fabulous to me i loved that he suggested it and of course at first everyone's like no i can't go i mean there's too much reality going on in in life but there was just something so charming about billy even suggesting it and the little twinkle in everyone's eye that it could be a possibility uh and 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 you know the people still even though not everyone can go phyllis phyllis found it to be quite a charming idea and that's what really matters uh even though like everybody else kind of turns it down and it gets down to phyllis's turn to decide if she could go on this little jaunt and uh she just immediately is like you know what why why am i even trying to fight this that's my boyfriend right there he's the one suggesting that we all just go have some fun that is why i'm with him that is one of the reasons why I love him. She's charmed by the fact that he comes up with these ways to make life better, to make life more fun, and add to it the fact that he's rented that apartment next door, he's been leaving her gifts of food that she loves outside the door, he's been playing music that she likes really, really loud, he's even been jacking up the TV so that they can watch their favorite shows together. There's just this sense of two people who want to be together and why are they not? So Phyllis just embraces him, she kisses him, and she tells him that she realizes she loves him. There is no reason not to be together when he makes her life better. And at the end of the day, isn't that what it's really about? Choosing to surround yourself, especially on Thanksgiving, with the people who make your life better. So it, they, she decides to take him back and take him up on the, the the Thanksgiving trip. I thought it was so cute and so fun and I loved also that at the the 11th hour Chelsea and Nick come through the uh the rotating doors of the athletic club which we never see. We always if you, the the foyer of the athletic club we always see people coming in and out of the rotating doors and this time we got this shot from uh on the outside the steps leading up to it and phyllis and billy are making out a little bit and then chelsea and nick come out and they say you know what 
on second thought, we just decided we have the money. We can be fabulous too. We'll just pay a babysitter an exorbitant amount of money to watch the kids for the weekend and we'll go with you to New Orleans to have a party, to have some fun. I loved that. I thought it was really cool. <laughs> So there you have it. Uh, the reason why we did not have a new show on Thursday and Friday is simply because everyone was out of town whooping it up on their private holiday. I got several really smart comments last week from people who mentioned a little loophole in Dina's diagnosis. We have never seen any test results that say Dina has Alzheimer's. And so when I started watching this week's show and everything that was unfolding with the Abbots, I was really keeping in the back of my mind that there is possibly a way out of this. But then Jack did say that even though he pulled the plug on the doctor's test that we saw last week. Um, he did confirm with the neurologist the, the, all of the tests that she had done at the hospital the previous week uh, that she does indeed have Alzheimer's. So we are being told it. I am going to, I guess just for the purposes of continuing the chat, I'm just going to su assume that this is the truth, that Dina does indeed have Alzheimer's and now Jack and Ashley are left to pour over the real possibilities of of what's going to happen in the future here. I mean, there is there is no cure. Dina is not going to get better. Um, it's just a matter of managing the disease. A, a mother will eventually be written off the show into long-term care, I'm sure. And, and not now, certainly. Things Things seem okay for now, but someday, someday that's what it's going to be. And and I, I did ha have a notion this week that I wonder if there's any chance that YNR is choosing to write this storyline for Dina as a way of writing an exit for her just in case something happened to the actress because um, I don't know I don't know how old uh, Jean Cooper was when she passed away but I would say she was maybe just a few years older than Marla Adams um, so I wonder if YNR is thinking they were they they happened to have a really fitting working exit for Catherine's character at the time of Jean's death, but I almost wonder if they are giving themselves a little bit of a parachute here just in case anything were to happen to Marla. I don't know, just tossing that out there. Um, it's, it's, it is, of course, very sad. Um, Jack and Ashley think <laughs> that they're learning this information and that Dina has no idea about it. I and mean, they think they have to prepare themselves for telling her that she has Alzheimer's. But surprise, Dina already knew. She already knew she had it. And that makes sense from a, a storyline consistency perspective. Um, she knew Graham had taken her to the doctor uh, in the past and it is making more sense now that that was part of the arrangement that she had with Graham, that he took her to the doctor and part of the reason why she was always asking him not to leave her was simply because she didn't want to be alone and maybe didn't trust you know what would happen to her or what her behaviors might be due to the disease so that all makes very much sense and jack even said do you remember when the last words we heard from graham he, he told he was telling ashley the last thing that graham said to me uh was good luck with that you know you want to you want dina all to yourself good luck with being her caretaker so Jack has those words ringing in his mind and is remembering um, you know, probably a string of things from the past now that are starting to add up. By the way, are we ever going to see Graham or is he completely gone? I would like to continue to see Graham, but the way uh, Jack was talking about Graham's parting words made it seem all very final to me. And I don't know how they would necessarily work him back into the story. So I, it just seems like he's gone. I mean, YNR just decided to cut 
a bunch of people. I don't, I don't, uh, I, I don't think that he's, we're going to see him again, but we are focused on the Abbots. We are focused on Dina and how we can make things better for her. And Jack has this very sweet determination to do the best that he can while he can for the mother that he loves very much. He decides to try to bring the family together to create a Thanksgiving to remember. Really, really nice and, and, and sweet idea. Um, and there's just no room for negativity. Uh, Jack actually decides to kick Nikki out of the Thanksgiving to remember. Nikki comes by the house right after Jack and Ashley are coming to terms with the fact that their mother has Alzheimer's and, and, and Nikki is tromping right on in, insulting Dina the way she probably has been for months now. But in, for Jack, now everything has changed. Now Jack is just taking everything she says as personal and insulting, whereas before the Alzheimer's, Jack was probably agreeing with Nikki, probably would have agreed with Nikki. I mean, Dina did stab her and now all of a sudden the attitude toward Nikki has changed when she has no idea of Dina's condition. Nikki has no idea that, that there's Alzheimer's and, and Jack doesn't tell her. He simply decided to, um, to devote everything he can to creating a positive environment for, for, for Dina and if Nikki can't bring that positivity then he's just done with her. He literally kicks her out of the house, hands her her coat and her bag and tells her to get out and she's disinvited for Thanksgiving too. I, I and, and and furthermore, kind of breaks up with her. Says I don't, I really don't know if I'm gonna see you again. You know, I mean, it's it was very surprising. I don't know if you guys were a little shocked by that. I mean, Nikki and Jack had become so close over the course of the past couple of months, and of course, I'm sure it's because we're working toward a Nikki and Victor reunion. But to have all of that closeness that they've been building in their relationship evaporate in an instant what was very surprising why didn't jack just talk to nikki why couldn't he just tell her about it it just seems like the abbots have decided to circle the wagons and anyone who is not an abbot is just excluded in fact uh Probably one of the saddest darts right up there, just about as sad as Dina's Alzheimer's, is Ravi showing up at the Abbott house all thinking that he's invited to Thanksgiving, like pie in hand, and having to be turned away by Ashley. Oh, I felt so bad for him. It was like a g g dagger in the heart. It was like a Thanksgiving dagger in Ravi's heart. They had a conversation apparently a couple days ago where Ravi was under the impression that he was invited to the Thanksgiving. I mean, why wouldn't he be? I, under any other circumstance, he would have been invited. And apparently, Ashley never had the intention of inviting him, even before she learned about this Alzheimer's stuff. So I don't know what the conversation and the miscommunication was there that happened between Ravi and Ashley, but he shows up at the door thinking he's invited and she has to try to nicely turn him away. Like, oh, oh, sorry, this is a family thing and you're not invited. It was so painful. I felt so, so bad for Ravi. I, Ravi, I don't know what the harm would have been in just allowing him in. Uh, it, it really, it really was sad. I don't know what the future is going to hold. I mean, the fact that YNR is kind of getting rid of some of the newer characters uh, that, that they had created just, you know, for like 20, what, 17, 2016. I, it doesn't make me feel very uh, positive that Ravi is going to be staying around. And I'm not sure if the fans are as committed to Ravi's relationship with Ashley as they once were. In fact, our poll question for this week is, do you think that Ravi and Ashley should rekindle their romance or are we on the way out with that? Uh, Whyrchat.com if you want to tell me if you think that it's, is it worth it? Is it worth Abby, uh, Ravi and Ashley uh, go, going through, seeing if they can bump it up? I mean, 
after the party, Ravi goes to the athletic club and he's talking to Phyllis about how he has realized that his feelings for Ashley have grown deeper than he ever thought that they would. I think Ravi's on the verge of wanting to tell Ashley that he loves her. He'd probably go buy a wedding ring. Oh, I hope he doesn't. Oh, I hope that he does not. Obviously, Ravi is not very good at picking up on nonverbal communication uh, signals because I would die a thousand deaths if, if Ravi like, thought that Ashley was so into him that he went and bought a ring and then she had to turn him down. That would be the worst. I just, I don't know if he's going to be on the show. This just seems, it just screams heartbreak to me. Um, I think YNR really screwed up by not cultivating that relationship and striking when the iron was hot. Now maybe it's too late. I don't, I don't know if they, if they are going to, to be able to, uh, I just can see Ravi leaving town with his tail between his legs. I don't think that Ashley meant to hurt him. It was so rude to just not embrace him. I don't know what harm would have come from just letting him sit at the table. I mean, it just, I, I don't know. I'm certain that she didn't do it to hurt and hurt him. I think that she was turning Ravi away in the same way that like Jack had turned Neil away earlier in the week by, you know, not letting him in the house, pretending that he had a cold. I think that the Abbots are just not wanting to include outsiders yet. I think they are just wanting to make sure that the family itself is informed about Dina's condition before they go and tell the outside world. Once again, a really good example of the way the Abbots operate versus the way that the Newb Newmans operate. But I mean, for crying out loud, Tracy is there for the Thanksgiving to remember. Abby shows up after, you know, the awkwardness that the Newman uh, family Thanksgiving, she shows up and they don't even know yet. Only Jack and Ashley know. They haven't had a chance to even tell the rest of the family. So I can understand why they just didn't want to have outsiders there. Um, it was, it's a hard thing to say. It's a hard thing to accept. And Jack and Ashley did their best to, to dance around it until they finally got the chance to tell Abby and Tracy and it was heartbreaking. I loved the way that uh, Tracy learned the information and she just kind of stood up and separated herself from the group and went off to the side and just like took her moment just kind of had her tears you know that's you know Tracy doesn't want everybody to see her being weak. I think Tracy tries very hard to be strong for the family. She tries to be the, the sensible one. And she had a moment where she just went to the side, turned her face away from the group, said, I'm going to have my tears and then pulled it back and brought it back and 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 went on to to be the uh, the the dove, the white dove angel that she is. <laughs> uh, of course, you know, Dina has kind of been in and out through all of this and she she walks in on the moment after everybody has been told and I just I do love Dina's attitude and the way that she's like okay well did they have a chance to tell you that I have Alzheimer's you know I mean it's pretty clear what's going on did they tell you or what you know I, mean, I just I do love her at I appreciate her attitude I appreciate that she is like yeah so what you know I mean this is what it is I already knew about it I've already come to terms with all of this it's your turn now you know but the, but the fact is I may be losing my my marbles but I'm not stupid I'm not a child you know I don't treat me like I'm dying I'm not dying right now I'm just going through you know the stages and I think that's it's so mature of her to have that attitude because dealing with someone else's disease and someone else's mortality is a whole nother thing than dealing with your own. So we have to give some space and some respect and some notice to Dina for taking this information about herself. I mean, this is a woman who she is so vibrant. She is just so full of life and so full of experience. And now to know that those experiences are going to start slowly slipping away from her and the fact that she can approach it with humor does set the tone for the rest of the family and how they are supposed to deal with it. Um, the rest of the evening really went on very nice. I mean, Dina was demonstrating a lot of like I said, humor and still being very sharp-witted. She's telling stories about her time in Paris. Everybody seems to be having fun and it feels like things are going on like normal, like it's fun. I mean, and, and 
and I th I'm sure that if you're if you're dealing with this, you are clinging to those wonderful, beautiful moments of normal because the moments where it's abnormal, uh, I'm sure, are just so emotionally consuming. So it's like nice to have this moment where Dina is recounting these crazy stories about Pierre in Paris, and then she has this teeny tiny little slip of a moment when she calls Abby Ashley. She looks dead at Abby and calls her Ashley and says, will you tell your brother, la la la. It was, I mean, that was very sad. And, and it, it, everyone in the room went, Ugh. you know, I mean, it's just like one of those, oh, uh, 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 you know, like this thing, this, uh, there's this unspoken thing between everybody but Dina uh, that was, it, that I'm sure is so very challenging. I have to admit, I mean, there, it, it is, what, I'm going to get Alzheimer's because <laughs> I'm going to because uh, that happens to me now. I mean, I literally will call my daughter by the cat's name or the cat by my, my call, call the cat my daughter. It's like that uh, that's going to be me. So I'm watching this thinking, well, this is my future for crying out loud. Uh, but, you know, it, it was it was a very kind of. So I did not pass the Alzheimer's test last week, and then this week she like I identified with it. I was like, crap, <laughs> that's me. Uh, but you know, I I feel sorry for the people around me already, and so that that kind of made me at least hone into the to the story a little bit more there too. And I liked the the way that everybody handled it too. Um, the, the Abbots really don't know what they're in for. You know, they don't know how the disease is specifically going to affect her. I mean, what is it going to do to her mind? What's it going to do to her physical physicality? But I liked the way Jack Jack kind of made his announcement and put it that you know we don't know what the shape of the future we don't know what shape the future is going to take. But what I do know is that we are all in this together. What more could you ask for? Um, I think this is this was a great family moment. It was a great moment of coming together. And Jack, at the very end of the episode, announces that he is going to take a leave of absence from Jabot. So he is fully committed. You've got to hand it to Jack for the way that he's decided to try to hold his family together. He is going to step back from Jabot and devote everything that he can to helping Dino, which I worry about Jack in that situation. It's very difficult to put yourself aside to try to help someone else. I think that that path may not work out very well for Jack, especially considering that he's pushing friends away already. He's pushed Neil away. He pushed Nikki away this week. I think that Jack's really, really going to need someone. Um, Phyllis is not as available as, as she was last week. Um, so I, I don't know. I do worry about Jack. You got to take care of yourself, too. You got to take care of your loved ones, but you have to take care of yourself, too. Uh, and I'm assuming that it's going to be left to Ashley, to take over the company, to take care of that business while uh, while Jack is taking care of Dina. And I don't know, possibly, possibly, will Ashley want her daughter Abby to be right there by her side in more of a, a, a capable uh, position? That figures. I start liking Zach on Friday and he's dead by Monday. Like, he's dead within the first five minutes of Monday's show. <laughs> holding the gun on Abby and Scott, but Crystal busts in out of nowhere, shoots him in the back. Pretty much everything is tied up with a neat little bow. Crystal has disappeared. No charges against Scott for Natalia's murder. The FBI is going to take over investigating Zach for the rest of the sex ring like they should have been doing long before now. And, unfortunately, all of Scott's investigative work that he's been doing on that story will have completely gone to waste because Victoria shuts down hashtag and wants to shuffle Scott around to another part of the company. Man, <laughs> Victoria's on the warpath. And when Abby returns to work, uh, Victoria also gives Abby a big fat demotion. It, it was a harsh week to be Abby and Scott. Like they pretty, they were like peaked and then pff, right down into the dirt. Um, Victor did explain to Abby 
about why he decided to appoint Victoria as the COO, saying simply that Victoria was a more viable candidate for that high-level position. And I thought it was a good way of explaining it. It made me understand it a little bit more. Abby was not prepared for that, that type of position. Victoria clearly had more experience. Abby, although she's been doing wonderful work at the company, has not been there as long, and she just doesn't have as long of a track record. I mean, someday, someday she may very well, but I thought, I thought Victor did a good job of explaining to her why it is that it was not today. Uh, but he also reminds Abby that Victoria is in charge. Abby will report to Victoria. There's no way around it. And uh, Queen Victoria decides that Abby can no longer be trusted with high-level projects. So she has been squeezed into a position where she can't screw anything up too badly. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, it's like, oh, it's tough because Abby's done a lot of good work, uh, but she did she did end up, um, unfortunately, being associated with something that's going to have screwed the company up real bad. It's tough. I always say this in life. It's like people never notice the things you do do. They only notice the things you don't do. It's like you could do 100 million great things and you never get thanked, but you do one thing wrong and then that's the thing you get in trouble for. Uh, so Abby and Scott are actually kind of in the same boat. They realize that they both just got screwed over by Victoria in their minds, and so they decide to team up. Abby and Scott have a little uh, handshake pact to try to get back at Victoria, to try to take her down. I have no idea what that means. I don't know if anybody has any prediction. All I, I mean, Abby and Scott pretty much just said, yeah, Victoria screwed us over, so let's just do something to get back at her. <laughs> I don't, I, I honestly, I don't know what possibly the plan could be, but I do like the idea a lot because Newman Enterprises is in a lot of trouble. The FBI investigation seems to be the one thing that's going to stick around from the sex ring storyline. I am positive that Christine and Paul are going to be on Victor like Hawks. They're going to be all around the company investigating everyone. Uh, and Victoria is going to be the one who is left to deal with the mess. I mean, their assets are frozen. They've got, I mean, they can't even make payroll at this point. It's going to be a really big challenge for Victoria to wriggle her way out of this. So she's going to have to be dealing with the FBI coming at her from the left while Abby and Scott are coming at her from the right. This is going to be a lot, a lot on her plate. And I don't know what Abby and Scott are going to do, uh, especially since they have that messy little issue uh, that, that, that happened between them, the messy little fact that they had storage locker sex together last week. <laughs> Um, I do appreciate that Abby and Scott went right back to, to bickering, uh, with each other, that they, they really have not even given themselves, and, like, they, they think no more highly of each other on the surface than they did before it happened, but specifically I love, <laughs> love, that Abby has now one more new thing to tease Scott about because they had a little run in at the coffee house where they were alone together and he tried to approach her like, hey, maybe we should talk about this. You know, I don't want to make a big deal out of it. But and Abby's like, oh, it's not a big deal. It is actually a very tiny deal. In fact, it's so tiny that I hardly knew it was happening. <laughs> That was great writing. Like that was that moment gave me the, the most genuine Chesser's catch smile that I've had in a while. I loved that. It was really, really a good zinger. Um, it's it is sad because <sighs> Scott is pulling away from Sharon, and. I think he's avoiding her, whether he means to or not. He is just like trying maybe to, I mean, I'm sure he feels guilty on one level, but at the same time, um, this is happening, like Scott is pulling away while Sharon is having a whole new appreciation for him. Now that he's home uh, and he's home safe, Sharon wants to like give him a welcome home party that is complete with sexy massage. 
this you know she wants her man back she wants to she wants to like f take their relationship t to the next level and there's a moment where uh, Sharon and Scott are on the couch uh, they, they're starting to kiss and he accidentally imagines that he's kissing Abby instead it was a really cool trick I liked it a lot the way that Scott and Sharon are kissing in the scene and then we cut to from Scott's perspective Abby's face but it's got Sharon, but it's Sharon's voice voiced over Abby's Abby's face it was just a really cool like I mean Scott is finding himself almost in this out-of-body experience where he, he knows he's kissing Sharon he's there with Sharon but he's thinking about Abby uh, it was a really cool trick but I I'm the, the fans the YNR chat fans are very very closely split on whether or not they think that Scott uh, and Abby should confess that their tryst even happened. 52% of you said no, do not confess uh, that, they, that you want to see Abby and Scott keep this whole thing a secret. But I mean, that's a close vote. 48% want, you, you know, want the secret to come out. The majority of comments that I saw where people saying no we don't want the secret to come out mostly because we like and enjoy Sharon and Scott we don't want to see Sharon get hurt we just don't want to go here let's sweep it under the rug and just move on with Sharon and Scott the, the problem though is at this rate uh, with the way Scott and Abby are both so clearly thinking about each other now I'm not sure that they're going to be able to keep it a secret Hillary attempts a live interview follow-up with Jordan on the Hillary Hour, apparently not remembering that Jordan had a few tidbits of information on her. Jordan, on a live show, tells Hillary's viewers that Hillary, too, has an alias. Oh, you want to have all of this tea spilled about me and my alias? Well, look at your host. Remember her, Ann Turner? That was such a good pull. I never would have thought of that, and it is so hypocritical that uh, that that um, that Hillary would have noted and exposed Jordan's aliases when she she had one of her own. I thought that was such a good tie-in. I can't believe Hillary didn't think of that. I can't believe that didn't occur to her, and that she wouldn't protect herself against that. Do we know? Did Jordan find out that information on his own, or did she end up telling him at some point? I'm not sure. Um, I am still waiting to find out what is going to become of Jordan because all of these other 2017 characters that we've had have become toast. Juliet, Graham, Zach, Crystal, possibly soon Dina, I don't know. I mean, that can't not bode well for Jordan or Ravi, frankly. Uh, and Jordan continues to make these semi-threatening uh, the semi kind of threatening comments toward Hillary um, and in, in fact he's making a, a semi threatening comment toward Hillary uh, this week when Devon walks into the middle of it happens to hear Hillary saying are you threatening me and then Devon kind of gets up on on Jordan and tells him to to back out of it and you can pretty much insert the the uh, the sound of Hevon fans heads exploding all around the world uh, I think I think we know where this is headed. Finally, because finally this week, Mariah breaks up with Devon. It's so needed to happen. I'm so glad it happened. Mariah finally just sat down with Devon. She knew she had to do it. Like the limbo was going on for way too long. She is coming to terms with who she is and she is realizing that it's not fair to keep stringing Devon along. And it, they had this very mature conversation about it. Mariah just points out that Devon's a really great guy and he deserves more than what she's capable of giving and on the flip side let's face it Devon doesn't love you know Devon you don't love me the reason you haven't said that you love me is because you don't <laughs> so let's just face it and move on uh, this this is not a good foundation for our relationship even if we were able to make it uh, work in the future she doesn't tell him of course about uh, the other feelings that she's having but she just kind of uh, breaks it off and and I was so glad. I just think it was a conversation that needed to happen. They were a couple that could have been, but for one reason or another, um, they just they just weren't.
Um, Devon actually confides in Hillary that it is over between he and Mariah, and it was kind of a funny, great little moment where Hillary embraces Devon, says that she's sorry, but you know on the inside she was screaming, yes! I'm an expert in nonverbal communication. <laughs> that was last week's Who Said It quote, and it was Zach. Uh, who said that he was using his mind reading skills on Abby and Scott saying he knew they had slept together because he's an expert on nonverbal communication. I thought that was kind of ironic given his profession which is very um, nonverbal and, and more on the physical side of things, the more of the physical communication. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people got that one right. It was Zach's last stand. His, his first and last who said it quote, as a matter of fact. Uh, 16 of you got it right, so I'm going to blaze through all of our winners here. Congratulations, Sandra, Henry, Anna, Consuela, Jamie, Susan, Leslie, Ellen, Ambreen, Heather, Justin, Tony, Nancy, Erica, Jillian, and Diane. Anna, you guys all got it right. I have a feeling there are going to be a lot of people who will get this one too. But as soon as I heard this quote, I knew it was it. I knew this was the one. A golden nugget just landed in my pan. <laughs> What a weird, weird thing to take out of context. A weird sentence to take out of context. A golden nugget just landed in my pan. Who said it? <laughs> if you think you know, you can go to yrchat.com. Leave your guess there on the website. And if you get it right, then I will give you your congratulations on next week's YNR Chat. Okay, let's crack this chatterbox. I got a lot of comments throughout uh, the week on the poll question from last week about the Abby and Scott affair, whether or not they should disclose it. Jamie, aka Lobster Lady, at yrchat.com says, I know that the storage unit sexy time secret will come out eventually. I just don't want it to be the reason that Sharon and Scott break up, nor do I want it to play any part in a chic reunion. It would be interesting to see Scott and Abby actually fall in love and have their secret creep up on them down the line and cause doubt uh, in fidelity. I wonder if Scott is just going to feel morally conflicted about keeping the secret. I can't necessarily see Scott breaking up with Sharon because of Abby, but I wonder if he's going to have this whole like moral conflict about it that makes him need to tell Sharon. And then I wonder what Sharon's reaction would be if it did go that way. Uh, T. Nicole at YRChat.com says, I always love the fall for the one you hate type of story. The secret will come out eventually, so it's better for Scott to break it off with Sharon once he comes to realize he has feelings for Abby. It's kind of ironic how Sharon is telling Mariah to end it with Devon and not lead him on because she knows he doesn't have this, that uh, she doesn't have the same feelings for him when the same can be said for Scott when he comes to realize he has stronger romantic feelings for Abby, not Sharon. You know what? I would love to see Sharon, if this is how it's going to go, I hope that Sharon, like, like if Scott breaks up with Sharon or tells Sharon, I want to see Sharon have kind of a more like Juliet style approach to it where it's like, you know what? It happened. That's fine. Um, I'm not going to go crazy and lose my wig over it. I am just going to accept it. And, you know, I, I just I like the self-assured Sharon. And if she's going to get her heart broken in a sense, I really hope that that doesn't create some spiral of craziness for her. That's all I'm hoping. Um, Mary Ann at YRChat.com says it would be interesting to see Lauren react to Abby in comparison to Sharon. She might wish she would, had been more welcoming to Sharon. What do you think? Would Lauren pr uh, prefer to have Sharon with her son or Abby with her son? I don't know. What kind of beef would, would uh, Lauren have with Abby? Abby just does. She, she doesn't do all that much. I mean, Abby tends to bumble into problems, but, you know, Abby's not really, um, I don't know, she's not too much of a troublemaker yet. Actually, I like this comment from Diana at YRChat.com saying, I wish YNR had some scenes showing Abby being upset about what she had learned about Zach. 
This was a person who she fell in love with and was living with. They spent a lot of time together as well as working together on their dating app. It wasn't very realistic how they never had Abby really take the time to grieve over him. Yes, she found out he was a bad guy, but feelings don't just magically disappear. My thoughts exactly, Diana. Wyatt should have had some kind of scene where Abby is at her house going through Zach's things, putting him in a box, giving him away. Like, I got no sense from Abby that this guy died. Like, yeah, I got a sense that she felt betrayed by the fact that he turned out to be a bad guy, but I got no sense of grief from her. I mean, he was a bad guy, but he's also now a dead guy. So I, I just, I keep wanting to think, oh, I hate to say it, but it just feels like a little bit of gap in the actress's ability to uh, to take me there. Like, I know that she wasn't given those lines. Obviously, Wyanor didn't give her that opportunity. But I'm also thinking back to Abby um, learning about Dina's Alzheimer's. All she did was sit there on the couch and say, I just got to know my grandmother, and now she's being taken away from me. And it just didn't feel big. Like, if I was her, I would have chewed that, like, if I was that actress, I would have chewed that scenery just a little bit more. Abby has been, in some ways, closer and had a better connection with Dina than anybody else on the scene, and she just kind of went, meh, and collapsed on herself, and it just didn't, I just didn't feel anything from her. I didn't feel anything from her about Zach's loss. She mostly just whines. She just whines from scene to scene. I go through phases where this, I like this actress, and I don't like this actress. Actually, no, that's not not correct. I go through phases where I can tolerate this actress. <laughs> oh. Leslie at YRChat.com says, I don't feel as sure as I did, Allie, uh, that Abby will not be pregnant just because she made that comment about the, uh, the birth control. The comment actually felt like it was there for a reason. Zach could have been changing her birth, birth control with fakes or perhaps uh, Abby could be getting an STD storyline related to Zach's uh, interactions with prostitutes. I heard that comment more than once, uh, actually. Uh, I never would have thought of that, but um, you guys could be right. Abby said that about, well, we slept together, Scott, but I'm on birth control, so don't worry. And, uh, you know, I assumed that that was the, the writers uh, telling us that we should not try to speculate about a pregnancy, but <laughs> uh, we are persistent, us we YNR fans. We will speculate about a pregnancy whether you tell us there's birth control or not. Damn it. <laughs> Anna also uh, left me a voicemail predicting that, uh, that, that uh, because Abby's on birth control, she'll end up pregnant and that the actress will either go away on her maternity leave and come back not knowing if the father is Scott or Zach. Certainly a possibility. Um, Julie at YRChat.com says, I love that Crystal shot Zach for her own self-preservation, and there's a legal defense called defense of others. She defended others' lives from a deadly force with deadly force. I don't think it mattered that he was shot in the back because that's the only uh, shot she had to defend and protect the others' lives. And it doesn't matter that she ran away afterwards. The result would be that the law would protect her even if she didn't know the law protected her. Very good comment, Julie. I have a feeling you're a lawyer. <laughs> I'm going to guess, uh, or maybe you're into crime, I'm not sure, because I never would have thought of that, but it, you make a very good point that Crystal uh, really could, if she were turned in uh, or turned herself in, probably would could be redeemed or and, and of the, the any um, uh, legal uh, penalty for, for the crime. But I think that it was Weiner's just like wanting her to go away because uh, Tessa was told about everything that happened with Crystal and saying, oh, you'll probably never see your sister again, which is just the way of telling the viewers we're probably never going to see Crystal again. Just forget about it. That didn't happen. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I, I'm kind of guessing that we just aren't going to see her again and they're going to sweep that up under the rug, which is too bad. I mean, Weiner just never gave us much of a reason to want to care about Crystal. Gary left me a voicemail. This one keeps ringing in my head even though you left it early in the week. Gary says, you do have to wonder why it is that Zach was never given words to speak on confessing to Natalia's murder. It does give you pause for thought, doesn't it? Because, you know, I keep thinking about that because normally the villain would have had a full confession 
right? And Zach didn't do that. I mean, we all are assuming that Zach murdered Natalia, but usually in the end, he would go, yeah, and I framed you for it too. But he didn't do that. And I keep I know I probably need to put this whole thing to bed uh, as far as who killed Natalia. It just seems like YNR is trying to sweep, sweep, sweep it away. But I keep thinking, is there more to it? Is there a reason, now that you mention it, that YNR didn't have Zach confess to Natalia's murder? Is there any chance that Scott actually did it? They, of course, cleared him of the charges, but why are they continue? You know, why is YNR continuing with the investigation against Newman Enterprises? Is there going to be more things that may Maybe are dug up in that investigation that could point toward Scott or point toward someone else in the company. What do you guys think about the fact that there's going to be this investigation at Newman? I don't know if I love it. Um, I, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just I don't like. Um, I don't know. I don't know what what's going to happen. It can't just be an investigation of the company. There has to be more dirt. Something they're going to have to find, and that's what what made me kind of hone in on that comment. Harper also left me a voicemail saying that the Genoa City PD has to be the most disrespected police force in the nation. Poor Paul. Not only did you have Sharon and Scott doing this counter surveillance, but now you've got Victor threatening you because you, you're doing your job investigating a crime. Yeah, expect to see that next week. It's going to be all Paul and Christine probably investigating Newman and all Victor and Victoria threatening uh, over it. And what are they going to find is my question. What are they going to find? It cannot be for no reason. That's the thing. Okay, this investigation is either going to, it's going to serve one of two things. Number one, to uncover something that we don't know yet and give us a new piece of drama to, 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 uh, to talk about. Or it's there to bring the Newmans together. It's certainly possible that now Victor and Victoria and Nick and everybody's going to just, call, they're going to come together around the, the company uh, because they're being wrongfully accused of something wrongfully investigated on something one or the other ACO on YouTube says I don't fault Victoria for her attitude toward Abby we've all seen Abby pull these kinds of stunts before and let's be real Victoria wasn't even wrong about it Abby did run off with Zach and at, after they escaped the storage unit they didn't call their families or the police they went check chasing after Zach you notice how everyone else was in new clothes so they were all out all night free and safe I have no I have zero sympathy for them and don't fault Victoria for wanting to fix a mess of Abby's creation. Uh, also, Daisy on Facebook says, I think Victoria is in part right and justified in demoting Abby. Abby should have been fired for dropping the ball where Zach is concerned, but she opted to date him and threw her business mind out the window. So I agree. Uh, so in that respect, I agree with Victoria demoting Abby as Abby's to blame uh, for not fully investigating Zach. But I don't agree that Victoria, in a sense, made it seem like Abby knew Zach uh, knew what Zach was doing. So now Abby can either be seen as a willing participant in Gra Zach's crime or as naive and incompetent. The truth is it's the latter, which is why I think Victoria is right to uh, demote her. It is it is weird though. I mean, Victor told Abby that Zach had been investigated and, and, uh, and, uh, and he didn't find anything. And Abby approached Victor about that and he said, oh yeah, well, I'm gonna, heads are gonna roll in my invest private investigator team. You would think that that would be, have been uncovered. And it, it, you know, Victor had assured Abby that Zach had been uh, checked out and that he passed the test. Ugh, that's just my thought. I don't know. I think Victoria is being a little harsh, but from a business perspective, I don't know if I would have demoted Abby. The thing is, that's why it's tough working with family because she still has to be sisters with her. I mean, it's Abby's not just an employee; she's family. So there has to be some a little bit of uh, of navigating to be done there. And Victoria's not real good at, at navigating uh, those waters uh, with anything less than iron fist. Consuela at YRChat.com says, I found the talk between Tessa and Nikki unbelievable. As the audience are supposed to expect that Tessa would confide in Nikki when we haven't seen them interact for months. I find that quite sad, actually. I really loved the Nikki and Tessa relationship, but the drop writers dropped the ball on that one. Amen. Um, I had lots of comments regarding um, Dina's Alzheimer's disease and also heard from a lot of people who have personal experience uh, with Alzheimer's uh, in their families, which I don't have. Um, but I, uh, I really like this comment from Leslie. 
giving us a little tidbit of why in our history, saying that back in the day, Catherine had Lyme disease that was mistaken for Alzheimer's. I kind of sort of remember that. Uh, Leslie also says Chris Christofferson was misdiagnosed with Alzheimer's, but it was Lyme disease. I wish we could have that happen, like a misdiagnosis, uh, but, but with the new writer's mother passing away from Alzheimer's, uh, he wants to tell this story, uh, although it's not being done well in, in Leslie's opinion. Uh, she thinks that this is a mistake equal to John's death that could never be fixed with ghost visits. Um, I had no idea that Mal's mom had passed away um, and had had Alzheimer's. That's really interesting. So it kind of makes sense now as to why he would take the reins and want to do this type of story. We had the uh, the service announcement that Jack did at the end of one of the episodes. So it's, it's it sounds to me, based on what you said, that it's, uh, it's personal for Mal and uh, that he's wanting to maybe do a little public service announcement here uh, with the story. Just wish we wouldn't have to use Dina to do it, but a lot of people are liking it. Um, a lot folly at yrchat.com says, like Mal Young, I experienced this disease through a parent. Oh, that just must be so painful. Um, lot folly says, I, I hope that as Dina's story progresses, the writing captures a truer portrayal of how the disease manifests itself. Otherwise, it was a mistake to use Dina's diagnosis as a catch-all for behavior that's unrelated or only peripherally connected to what Alzheimer's is about. Yes, absolutely. I think it has to be handled correctly. Um, they can't just use this as an excuse to let Dina go off and do quirky things you know, quirky things. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people that are already connecting with this uh, storyline and to them uh, is, is, is actually creating kind of some realism. Anne Boleyn on YouTube says, in regards to Alzheimer's, it affects different people differently. Some live with it for years, while others it takes quickly. Um, as far as the humor aspect, this is also accurate for some. My father can actually remember most of the things he did when, uh, after he had uh, gone through an Alzheimer's episode, and some things are bizarre and scary, you name it. Uh, to save him from the embarrassment, we use humor to help him get over what had happened. My father can function most of the time, but we've had to take his keys, credit cards, money, and ability to live on his own, so laughter and humor has been key. Some may find it offensive, but it truly works for our family. Um, and also Justin at yrchat.com, I had asked him last week uh, regarding his grandmother. He, he had experienced this um, in his grandmother and I had asked if he felt this was a uh, appropriate writing uh, of this type of disease and, and Justin says, uh, because Dina is very early in her Alzheimer's, I don't think that YNR is making her silly, but I do understand how you or someone else would think that. My grandmother was very severe in her Alzheimer's. It, if um, if I was to make a list of all the bizarre and outlandish things she did, you would think I was exaggerating. Dina popping out of the car was mild. I also want to say that I like Dina. Um, it, I that I like that Dina is fully aware that she has Alzheimer's. It's not uh, common, but it's possible that people are very early in the disease. They can know that they have it. I met a man last month that was diagnosed with the disease over a year ago, and he's fully aware of it. And I again want to give YNR a thumbs up on that. Um, actually, I'm thinking back to a voicemail Anna also left me like two weeks ago saying that she there were some kooky things that um, that I think she had a, a mother-in-law maybe, I can't, I can't remember specifically, but a family member that had uh, Alzheimer's and they're just these like things that they do. I'm sure that part of it too is just I don't know anything about it. I mean, I really... This is maybe just a, a gap in information for, for what I know. I just, um, I, I don't know much about Alzheimer's. I don't know anyone who's been personally affected by it. So um, maybe it's just more, uh, maybe I was kind of viewing it as YNR taking it in a kooky road. But then again, you know, I mean, going back to the, the other comments uh, from, from other people, I think that it has to be handled just right. It's a kind of a, a balance, right? It's kind of a thin line. Um, oh, speaking of Anna, uh, she had also left me a voicemail on Friday night, or uh, no, left me a voicemail on Thursday to tell me that on Friday, YNR had aired an episode 
of Nick and Sharon's wedding. Um, I think it was it was like their last wedding. I didn't know. I didn't get my voicemails before uh, I, I I before Friday, and I'm so mad at myself because I was totally at home doing nothing on Friday at 11. I should darn well have been watching that episode, and I didn't know it. I just assumed that there was no Thursday, and so there was no Friday, and I I I, I missed the ball. I didn't watch either of the classic episodes. I only watched my three. So uh, if you guys want to tell me how you felt about the classic episode. You can leave me comments about that this week, too. Um, Kiki on YouTube said, I was a little miffed with Nick. The Newman family should all be aware of Chelsea's past. She came to town on a very public con. With all the dirt in the Newman closet and also the fact that Victor had a hand in Adam's death and now the, se now the secret about Adam's baby would be something to be mad about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Consuela at YRChat.com says, Devon is just a useless and pathetic character. <laughs> Every time he tries to defend Hillary against Jordan, I just want to slap him. He doesn't know what's going on, but he's sticking his nose into someone's business. Um, do you think you, uh, is, is Devon a useless character? Maybe, because, I, you know, I feel, I feel like Devon's kind of one of those guys like, um, like Nick or Paul or whatever, where he's not like really bringing the action forward he's more of the love interest and he's more he's just more passive within the story I mean Hillary's the only reason I've ever felt anything for Devon uh, so I'm kind of look I'm looking forward to their reunion um, Tony at yrchat.com says Hillary looks lovely in almost every outfit I love love loved the blue one shoulder top from Monday's episode the ruffle was a bonus and her lipstick perfectly matched the pink flowers in the top a raspberry color but ribbons <laughs> I love that comment and yes I agree I think part of another part of my fascination with Hillary is just I'm like she's so beautiful like it's everything is perfection every episode I don't know who styles her but they should style everybody on the show because they are getting it right um, were there any other Thanksgiving fashion notes that anybody wanted to mention who looked good well how about some ribbons and raspberries for the Thanksgiving attire um, the only the only person that really really stuck out to me was Nikki I mean she very smartly chose a sensible three quarter length dress uh, on the sleeves so that her uh, quarter, three quarter length sleeves so that her knife wound could be adequately visible through the entire meal. Well, how about that? Only three of new episodes of YNR, but I managed to stretch it out and talk uh, the full YNR chat on it. I still probably missed a lot of things, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure that's where you guys will come in. So please feel free to leave me your comments at yrchat.com or you can go uh, and call my voicemail 309-588-4569. Um, I hope everybody had a really lovely holiday. I'm stuffed and I'm sick of leftovers already. <laughs> uh, looking forward to next week with some some different foods and some new YNRs. <laughs> okay, everybody, have a good week, and I'll see you next time. Bye.